Hi, uh, welcome to tonight's Be Ready to Play webinar in partnership with UPMC. So tonight we're going to, uh, we have Laura O'Mahony, or Laura Mahoney on, um, who is doing a webinar for the Sports Science Workgroup uh, on nutrition. And the title of the webinar is How Nutrition is Key to Help You Be Ready. Uh, Laura is a consultant, uh, dietitian and performance nutritionist with the Sport in Ireland, Ireland Institute. She also uh, works for Waterford Senior Hurlers and is secretary of the Sport and Exercise Nutrition Group of the INDI. So um, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Laura. You're very welcome, Laura. Thanks very much, Cahill, um, and thank you for the introduction. I'll just share my screen here now. And hopefully everyone can see and hear that okay. So just in terms of a little bit of background about me. So as Cahill said, I am a registered dietitian and a sport and exercise nutrition um, registered performance nutritionist. I'm from County Leash. I have played all my camogie with our local camogie club, the Harps, here in Leash. Um, and I suppose since qualifying as a dietitian about 12 years ago, I've worked clinically, but more specifically in sports over the last eight years or so. And I've worked with a number of different teams um, between camogie, ladies football, hurling, um, and at the moment, as Cahill said, I'm working with the Sport Ireland Institute, so preparing athletes ahead of the Tokyo Olympic Games. And also I have my own private dietetic practice and I'm working with the Waterford um, Senior Hurlers. Um, I suppose one of the, the main reasons I'm presenting here this evening is because I've also been on the nutrition subgroup of the Gaelic Games Sports Science Working Group over the past number of months, which is chaired by Dr Sharon Madigan, along with my colleagues Catherine Norton and Ronan Doherty. And I'm also secretary of the Sport and Exercise Nutrition Group of the um, Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute. And the reason I mention that is because when it comes to nutrition, everyone, everyone eats food, so everyone has an opinion on food. And when it comes to nutrition, I suppose everyone everyone likes to think that they know best about food because based on their own experiences. So it's just a little word of caution, I suppose, when we are accessing sports nutrition advice that we are getting it from accredited professionals because social media and like I said, everybody has their own opinion. So just make sure you're getting your nutrition advice from accredited um, professionals. And that group is a, a useful access point for um, registered practitioners in Ireland. So in terms of what um, tonight's session is going to cover, so a few key areas. So number one is just the role, the overall role of sports and nutrition in Gaelic games. What makes a healthy player, how you can prepare for your training and your periodization of nutrition. So as we go to move through our different um, stages of our, our Be Ready to Play programme. So moving from your activity into your development through to your Prepare to Play, which is coming up um, and ahead of our Prepare to Perform phases. It's just giving you an insight as to how your nutrition needs to change accordingly. And just as we prepare for training, how can we make sure we're recovering from training? And then I'll just finish off with some common mistakes that we see in practice along with um, some tips in terms of how coaches or parents may support positive behaviours. I also, I suppose, just want to bear in mind that uh, it's tonight's um, session is covering a whole range of, of, of people. So whether we have our underage, we have our senior adults, we have parents, we have coaches. So I just want to make sure that, you know, everything we, we speak to tonight, there might be some bits of it that are more relevant than others. Um, because I am trying to cover a wide, wide base of people tonight. So moving on then to the role of sports nutrition in Gaelic games. So in terms of what, what can we do? Why am I here talking to you tonight? Well, what we want to make sure is that we are helping support fit and healthy players. 
And how we can do that is number one, we want to try and reduce our injury risk. So to how nutrition can help reduce your injury risk is to support your, your fueling for and your recovery from training. So by reducing fatigue at, towards the end of sessions, we can help reduce injury risk. By looking after our nutrition, we can also help reduce our risk of illness. High intensity exercise can suppress our immune system. So if we can make sure that we're eating at the right times um, after heavy training, especially high intensity training sessions, we can help reduce our risk of illness. We can also um, facilitate training adaptations by eating the, I suppose, eating to support that training. We know that with a, a variety of nutrients and the right type of nutrients at the right time, we can help you to train harder and train longer. If you train harder and longer, you're going to get greater overload on the body. If you get greater overload on the body, you can get enhanced adaption. And if you get enhanced adaptation, you can become a fitter player. We can also help support optimised body composition, I suppose, particularly for our, old, our um, senior players. And we can also work to help in terms of match day performance. So they're just some of the key roles that sports nutrition play in Gaelic games. And then in terms of nutrition service. So in order for a nutrition service to achieve that fit and healthy player, there's six key blocks that we tend to focus on. And those six key blocks are going to be the, the foundation. So nutrition for health. Once we have that, um, the basis of that tick, we can focus in on our training nutrition, our recovery nutrition, our match specific nutrition, our supplements and our food provision. And they form the, those key blocks of our, our nutrition service. So I suppose the, the key bit is getting the foundations right. So when we're when we're talking about foundations, um, I like to use the, the cupcake analogy. So um, what we what we like to make sure is that we have that base or the foundation proper and that base is going to be your daily nutrition. So that's making sure you're getting your, your carbohydrates, your proteins, your fats, your, your vitamins and minerals, the whole range of nutrients you need on a daily basis to be that fit player. Then we look at the, the timings, the type. So this is what we I would consider maybe the icing on top of the cupcake. So looking at the timing of your carbs and your protein, you're looking at your hydration strategies, making sure your fueling and your recovery is, is timed around those training sessions. And then we might look for that extra one or two percent, your peak performance the sprinkles on top. So maybe looking at your supplements, um, nutrition support, food provision. But if we go in with those sprinkles straight away, there's nothing there for them to stick to. So we need the foundations there initially before we can start adding in that extra one to two percent. So it's about getting that base right. And that's what I want to spend a good bit um, tonight talking about is, is what makes that healthy player. So in terms of that healthy player, um, we, we sometimes talk about the, the go, grow, glow foods. So your, your go, grow, glows are again those range of nutrients that we can get from our, our carbohydrates, our vitamins and minerals, our proteins, our fats and our water. So our goal foods are going to be the foods that we need to supply energy to our body. So they're going to come predominantly from our carbohydrates and our fats. Our carbohydrates, so your bread, your pastas, your rice, your potatoes, your cereals, they're the, that's the key energy source for our working muscles in Gaelic games. And we need to make sure that we're, we're timing our carbohydrate intake around our training sessions. We also can't, um, can't forget about our fats. Our fats are an excellent source of energy as well. And we need them to provide energy alongside our carbohydrates. When we talk about our grow, flu, grow foods, um, we're talking about our proteins. So this is what we need for our growth and development and repair of our muscles after training and for growth and development of our younger athletes. So when we're talking about our proteins, we're talking about our meat, fish, eggs, beans, pulses, soya, all of our entire protein range that needs to be split over the course of the day and timed around our trainings to help make sure we're getting all of our nutrients. The third group is the one that's sometimes forgotten about. Um, a lot of people will talk about their carbs and proteins, but they'll actually forget about the, the glow foods. So these are the foods 
that are providing an awful lot of the vitamins and minerals that our body needs to actually access the energy we're getting from our carbohydrates or our proteins. So our glow foods tend to come from that whole color spectrum. So your, your fruit, your veg, and an awful lot of the, the brightly colored foods provide an awful lot of antioxidants, vitamins and minerals that we need to support the body. I have a couple of different visualizations of these kind of go, grow, glow foods. And whether we're talking about it via the food pyramid, which is, again, it, it's the same type of concept. So it's you're, you're predominantly looking about getting your food intake from those, the veg, your whole grains, you're getting your calcium containing foods. You're also looking to get your proteins and your fats. So whether we're looking at the food pyramid or the eat well guide, whichever you're more familiar with, they're all saying the same thing in terms of it's the, the variety of foods is key for a healthy diet. But I tend to use the athlete plate model when, when I'm working with players because it's just a good visual for thinking of each meal. And again, the ratios of how much carbs, how much protein, how much veg will change as your training session and as your intensity changes. But we'll, we'll go through that um, throughout the, the session tonight. But the foundation of this healthy player is making sure that each meal has that carbohydrate element, it has that protein element, it has the fruit and veg element, and it has your fats. But also bear in mind that food is fuel, but yes, yes, but it's also fun and it's sociable. Um, so we need to enjoy our food. So we need our meals to taste nice. So it's not just a case of having your carbs and protein. We need to make sure that our food is enjoyable at the same time. Um, and also our fluid intake. We need to make sure that alongside our meals, we're trying to match our fluid intake. And I'll talk specifically on flu fluids as we go through the session. So other nutrients of note. So yes, we have our carbs, we have our proteins, we have our fats, we have our glow foods, but there are a couple of particular nutrients of note that I just want to mention this evening. And they are our calcium and our vitamin D because of the role that these both have in our bone health. So when we're talking about our calcium in particular, um, the, the fact that up to 90% of our peak bone mass is acquired by the time we're 18 for females and by 20 for males. So it, it just emphasizes the fact that it's really important for young people to invest in our bone health. Alongside playing an important role in bone health, vitamin D also plays an important role in our immune system and our muscle function. So these two combined are key nutrients. And in terms of where we can find them in our foods, our calcium sources, your, I suppose some of your richest calcium sources are going to be your dairy foods. So your cheese, your milk, your yogurt. So making sure that if you don't consume much dairy in your diet, that your milk or your yogurts are fortified with calcium products. I also have um, here some sardines. I must, I must stop using that picture, a tin of sardines, because not very many people eat sardines anymore. So we have a tin of sardines, which are rich in calcium, as are foods like bread, tofu, um, broccoli and oranges. So there's a good variety of foods, but making sure that if you are using alternative dairy sources, that your sources are fortified with calcium to make sure you are hitting your calcium intake. In terms of vitamin D sources, one of the biggest sources of vitamin D is the sunlight. If I was doing this presentation at the start of winter, we may be looking at talking about um, introducing some vitamin D supplementation, but because we're coming into the summer months, we can actually get vitamin D from the sunlight during the summer months here in Ireland. Other sources of vitamin D are also going to include your fortified foods, so fortified cereals, fortified milks, oily fish and eggs. They're all excellent sources of vitamin D. Another nutrient that's particularly important for um, Gaelic players, for all um, athletes in general, is going to be iron. And the reason why iron is so important is because of its role in transporting oxygen around the body. So in terms of giving your muscles the oxygen that it needs to work when we're training, and also from that energy production point of view, in terms of symptoms of iron, so how would you know if you if you don't have enough iron? Some of your symptoms are your, your tiredness, your lack of energy, shortness of breath, poor recovery, 
which all will kind of lead to impaired performances. And I suppose we, as females, we need to be particularly mindful of our iron intakes because of monthly iron losses. So what we need to do is make sure that we have a variety of foods included in our diets. And again, I suppose bearing in mind that red meat is absorbed, the iron in red meat is absorbed up to about seven times better than some of the iron in our cereals, our fruit and our nuts. So again, if we are following a vegetarian or vegan diet, that we need to be particularly mindful of the range and sources of iron, some of which I have listed here um, in our diet to make sure we're getting a, a variety of iron at each meal and that we do use vitamin C to help with the absorption of non-meat containing iron. So if we if we have our, our, our all of our range of our carbohydrates or proteins or fats, we have our fruit and veg, we're being mindful of particular nutrients such as maybe our calcium, our vitamin D, our iron. The next thing to, to be mindful of is our total energy. And again, for a, a healthy player, we need to make sure that we're trying to match our energy in with our energy out. If we have too much energy going in, we, it, it can, I suppose, end up in slowing us down on the pitch, which potentially could increase our injury risk. But similarly, if we have too little energy going in, the signs may not be as obvious. Um, so some of the signs when we have too little or when our energy availability is lower, some of the signs can be similar to what I mentioned there from a, a low iron um, intake in that we might be tired, we might not be recovering properly, we may be picking up niggles. If for females periods might stop, um, it's, it's kind of similar to, I suppose, if you think about your phone, if your battery's about to die on your phone, it goes into power saving mode and it shuts down any applications that it doesn't need at that point in time. And our body kind of does the same if we don't have enough energy for the training that we're doing. So our body will save energy by providing less energy for growth, reproduction, bone health. So it's just being mindful, I suppose, that it's not always as obvious as, oh, I'm losing weight. There might be other bits that are, are there in terms of that poor recovery, the constant niggles, the tiredness um, that creep in if we don't have enough energy for the training that we're doing. So it is a balancing act. And in terms of how to manage that balancing act or how do you know if you're getting enough food? That's what I'm going to touch on now in terms of preparing for training and that periodization of nutrition. So in terms of training nutrition, um, your, your nutrition goals and requirements, they're not static. So they're going to change as the season changes. And just like we're going into, into different seasons, into different phases, normally you'd have your pre-season, your in-season, your off-season. With our Be Ready to Play program, we have our activity phase, our development phase. We're about to go into our prepare to play phase, and then we will be moving into our perform prepare to perform phase. So as we're moving through the phases, the intensity of those sessions will be changing. And the key question to ask yourself is, are you eating the same every day despite your training changing? So if you're finding that you're eating the same thing, the same amount of foods, but your training changes, that might be a, a trigger question to make sure that you are periodizing according to your training, that you are changing up your nutrition to match the demands of your session. Typically, what some people will do is that they'll come to that pre-season block and they'll, even though pre-season might be particularly hard, extra sessions, higher intensity sessions, that might be the time that they decide to kind of clean up their diet. So they'll end up with a an increased energy demand from the training session with a reduced energy intake. And that's where that mismatch of energy intake versus energy output happens. So it's just making sure that as training intensity increases, that we are we're changing what we're eating to try and match. So diving into a little bit more detail, now there might be too much detail here for some people, and I will move back to those pictorial images um, after this after these couple of slides, but some people want numbers. Um, so in terms of how much carbohydrates to be taken in over the course of a day, 
you're looking at a range of three to five grams per kg body weight when we're in like a lighter, low intensity sessions or skill based activities, up to about six to 10 grams of carbs per kg body weight for that, you know, your high, moderate to high intensity that lasts over an hour session. But that only works if you know what 50 grams of carbs or 100 grams of carbs looks like. You know, you need to be able to, I suppose, to, to picture what those um, volumes look like. So sometimes the, those plate models actually work much better because you can have a much better visual on a per plate model of how your carbohydrate is changing according to your sessions. The other key nutrient is your protein. And again, you're looking at anything between about 1.2 to 1.8 gram per kilogram body weight. But the key bit with your protein is making sure that it's split throughout the day. So in terms of the graph on the right hand side here, traditionally people would tend to have had like a small amount of breakfast, protein at breakfast, a little bit more maybe at lunch, but most of the protein might come at dinner in the evening. But actually from a muscle point of view, in terms of maximizing your, your muscle protein synthesis or that buildup of muscle, um, you're much better off having three to four sort of equal portions of protein split throughout the day. The other key one there then is our fats. Like I said, um, we're talking then about 20 to 35 percent of our total energy coming from our fats, in particular our unsaturated and our omega trees are our key fats. To, to be mindful of that we do need and that are essential. So principles of fueling. So based off that, so we're, we're talking about the three, the three T's here, your total amount, which is based on some of the, the figures that you've just seen on that last slide. The type, which is your, your carbohydrate, your protein, your fat, um, the types of food and the timing of it. They're the three key principles when it comes to fueling for your training. And that all comes down to planning. And, you know, over the past year nearly, we've all been at home. You know, we've been in charge of our own schedules. We can train when we wanted to. So this is just an example of one of the timetables in um, for, I think it was actually for this block at the moment. So you could pick your schedule, you could pick what time you were doing your, the, your sessions at, as most people were home from school or home from work. But as we now move into, um, everyone is back in school at least at the moment, um, and group training sessions are going to kick off from next week, there's going to be more planning involved. So the planning of when you eat. So in order for you to get the type, the total amount and the timing right, you need to be able to plan your food intake around those sessions. So whether it is you might be coming home from school at half four, you get delayed, you're not home till five and you have a pitch session starting at six o'clock. You're not going to have time to have a dinner before a pitch session. So in that instance, it's a case of, OK, well, what kind of a snack can I have that will give me energy for my session? And then I come home and I have my dinner after my session. Or it, could be, it might work the other way around that your pitch session might be a little bit later. You get home from school on time and there is time for dinner before pitch session and then um, snack afterwards. So it's all about the planning. Without the planning, it's very hard to get those three T's right. So in terms then of the so going back to the, the plate models. So if it's an easy training session, how does your plate look? So again, this is a, just an example of how this might look in reality. So we have three different types of plates. We have an easy, easy training plate. We have a moderate training plate and we have a, a hard session plate. And it's the amount of carbohydrates that will change on those plates. So whether we're talking about breakfast, lunches or dinners, it's the, the concept of being able to change the amount of food on your plate to match those energy demands. So how does this look like in reality? You know, there's nothing fancy here. So these are three meals. So we have uh, like a, a salmon, rice and stir fry veg. We have a potato, chicken and uh, beetroot and carrot salad. Or we have your traditional potato, chicken and veg um, option. So it's just that visualization of how those carbs sit if it was an easy training day and how that might look then when it goes to a moderate training session. So if it's a moderate training day, 
those meals might look more like this, where there's more that little bit more carbohydrate in your in your meal. So whether that is your your breakfast, so your porridge um, with some granola, and then you add in some fruit and your proteins coming from your milk, that's hitting all three of those, whether it's a, a rice curry and veg or something like a smoothie. And in this smoothie, there will be porridge oats, which would be your carbohydrate. You would have your um, milk and protein, milk and yogurt, which would be your protein source. And then your um, two different fruits, which would be your, your fruit and veg section. So again, it's just giving ideas, I suppose, of how these um, low, moderate or hard training plates might look. So again, if we move to a hard training plate, that might be actually adding in some toast into your breakfast. It could be having extra pasta along with your chicken. It could be a large bowl of spaghetti along with your bolognese or it could be extra potato with your chicken and beans. So, it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the food is. It's the that combination of the of the different ratios of carbohydrate or the different portion sizes as you're as you're changing up your training sessions. So in terms then of snacks, they're your main meals. Well, how do your snacks match your, your training day? So say, for example, it is a school or a work day. So you're at school or work from a 9 to 4 p.m. You're at home, you're going to training from 6 to 7.30. What you might do on a set, and you know it's going to be a hard um, pitch session, that might look like a moderate sort of breakfast, uh, a large lunch for work or school, a large um, carbohydrate based dinner, but you might have to have that after as opposed to before. So then you need to think, OK, well, what snacks can I have then to cover me in between lunch and going to that session? And in that instance, that could be something like having a cereal bar, having a banana, having a smoothie before you go to your training session because we want the, the food before you go to a training session. We want it to be easily digestible. We want it to be easy on the stomach. We want it to be rich in carbohydrates. So some of those snacks that I mentioned there are all rich in carbohydrates. So whether it's that slice of toast with a banana and peanut butter, bowl of cereal, smoothie, banana bread, flapjacks, whatever that might be, they're all rich, um, easily available carbohydrate sources for your training day. If it is a lighter day, um, well, then your your day might look something like this. So it might be three of those sort of moderate training um, plate days that you have. So you might have your, your three moderate meals as opposed to your higher intensity meals. And maybe your extra snacks might be your, again, your fruit, your yogurt, your rice cakes, peanut butter, your nuts. Um, just it, there's still snacks in it. They're just a different um different type of snack because you might not need as much carbohydrate on that particular day. So they're just examples of how you could mix and match those types of training plates to suit the type of training that you're doing. Along with um, making sure you're fueled appropriately for your session, we also want to make sure that your hydration is spot on. The reason why we're key to make sure your hydration is it's part of your fueling for is because when you look at the amount of um, water that is your blood and muscles are made up of, that's essential because they're the two key um, areas that we're going to rely on to be transporting our oxygen and our glucose to our working muscles. So everyone is different. A lot of people will, will you know, have heard of, oh, I need two litres of water. But requirements will vary and it will depend on genetics, body size, fitness, environment. So I suppose the temperature outside and also the intensity of the exercise. So some people are going to be uh, some people are, are large volume sweaters. Others will be might not sweat as much. So it's being mindful of how much you sweat, um, how what your body size is, what your fitness is, what the temperature outside is. And that's all going to influence how much fluid you might need to take on board. So normally we're targeting about 35 mil per kilo body weight is, is a, a sort of a baseline fluid target. But then you would be looking for extra um, per training session. So if you do a training session and you sweat an awful lot during it, you need more on top of that. And a good way of knowing how 
if you are dehydrated or if you need more fluid is monitoring your urine color. So you'll see here on the, the first cup here on the left hand side, that's from a hydrated player, whereas the, the last cup here is a dehydrated player. So the darker the urine, the more dehydrated. We're naturally going to be a little bit more dehydrated when we get up first thing in the morning um, after an overnight sleep. But as the day progresses, and particularly if we're heading into an evening training session, our urine colour should be getting clearer. In terms of the, the effects of the body on of being dehydrated, they're all key for whether it's camogie, football, um, hurling, whatever it is, your, your particular sport, if we're talking about decreased concentration, decreased alertness, um, increased fatigue, an increased rate of perceived exertion, an increase in reaction time, they're all going to influence your performance on the pitch. So your endurance or your intensity is going to be impacted, your coordination and your skill and your concentration and decision making. So it's, a, it's really important, I suppose, to, to get into a good routine of of, of drinking throughout the day. So having a water bottle with you, sipping on it throughout the day, so as you're not going um, half an hour before training, realizing, oh, I haven't drank very much today, and you're down in a pint of water. You're much better off if you can get into a routine of, of regularly drinking throughout the day. Moving on, so, so if, if we're fueled and we're hydrated and we're going to our training session, how then can we um, look at how nutrition can help in terms of recovering from training? So when it comes to recovery, it's, it's a total package. It's the whole body. And I suppose I break it down into the three big rocks of recovery. And those rocks are your nutrition, your regen and your rest. Nutrition, so we're going to talk about a lot of ores. There's going to be a lot of ores of recovery here. So nutrition, I'll go into some ores there in a moment. So we'll talk about nutrition in a little bit. The regen bit, so if anyone um, listened to Helen's talk, which was on reducing injury risk two weeks ago, um, Helen spoke a lot about the, the regen and she had four R's of, of recovery, which were react, regenerate, restore, refine. So whether it was your movement session, your yoga, your prehab, your prep, your prime, whatever regenerative activity you're doing for your muscles, that's one part of recovery. But the other two key important bits are your rest or your sleep and your nutrition. Sometimes sleep is um, sleep is under underrated or some people don't re realize the importance of sleep in recovery. It's probably, you know, one of the, the, the biggest elements of where our body does its recovery is overnight while we're asleep. So making sure that we're getting good quality sleep along with a lot of good quantity of sleep. So sleep quality and sleep quantity are going to help recovery. And some nutrition bits that you can do to make sure you're not impacting your sleep is making sure that if you're going to start working on your hydration, that you don't start drinking a lot late at night, which could then impact your um, the amount of times you have to get up during the night to go to the bathroom. So you want to avoid that. So make sure your fluid intake is earlier in the day. Avoiding drinking caffeine too late in the day, because again, caffeine is a stimulant and that can impact on your sleep. Um, and then probably one of the key bits is making sure you have good routine. So in terms of your, your sleep time, your bedtime and your wake time, that you're, you're, you're consistent or that you're in a good routine with this. And then the fourth one, probably the hardest one, is leaving your phone out of the room before, when you're going to bed. So all of those can help improve sleep. So in terms of recovery, three big rocks, nutrition, regen and sleep. And when we're, when we're specifically talking about nutrition, it's the three R's. So it's your rehydrate, it's your refuel and it's your rebuild. We'll have to do a quiz after this on all the R's of recovery. <laughs> so in terms of um, rehydrate, so as I've just said from the, the last slide there on hydration, the, the value of your of being hydrated during um, hurling football camogie, it, it cannot be underestimated. So we're assuming you're going to your training sessions hydrated, but you are going to lose fluid during the training session. So you're going to sweat, you're going to lose fluid. So we need to make sure that you rehydrate after training sessions. 
same with your refuel. We're assuming that you're going to your training session. You've, you, you, you have fuel in the tank for your training session. But as you do your training session, by the end of it, your the amount of energy left in your muscles is going to be um, depleted. So we want to make sure that you refuel. So you're putting energy back in to help prepare for your next training session. So your refuel will be your carbohydrate element of your, your post training meal. And with your rebuild, that's putting back in your protein to help with the rebuild, the repair of your muscles, which have been working hard during that training session. So it's all about your fluid, your carbohydrate and your protein. So getting those three in combination after a training session to help with recovery. And again, there's no magic, you know, there's no magic food. So in terms of examples of post training recovery foods, it could be a chicken sandwich, it could be eggs on toast, it could be a bowl of cereal with a glass of milk, it could be a smoothie, it could be a burger and chips. All of these have a protein element, a carbohydrate element, and you're adding a fluid element to make sure that you are getting those three hours of recovery. So that is, I suppose, some of your key bits in terms of your recovery from training. So then just to touch on some of your the common mistakes that I come across, um, I suppose, in practice. And some of these are um, the first one is, is that not planning bit. So it's very hard to make better choices if you haven't planned. So take, for example, you come home from training. There's no food ready. It's late. You look in the fridge. You don't know what's there. You don't know what you can make. And you end up, oh, I'm so tired, I'll have a slice of toast and I'll go to bed. That is a poor choice because if you had planned in advance, you would have been able to either have something taken out of the freezer or you'd be able to whisk up something like um, scrambled eggs on toast along with a glass of milk. And there we go. We have proper recovery and then our body is going to recover better while sleeping overnight. So not planning is is really detrimental to being able to to make better choices. So in terms of, you know, even as something as mundane as printing off a little weekly schedule and planning when you're going to shop, what your meals are going to be for the week, that can help significantly in making sure that you're you're getting your nutrition at the right time. Another common mistake is sometimes eliminating some major food groups for no particular reason other than it might be something on trend on social media. So like some people will eliminate dairy and then maybe not um, consider some of the their other sources of calcium. So then they might be um, not meeting calcium requirements, which in ca can impact on bone health. Or some people will eliminate fats. Fat seems to be, you know, one of those key groups that people tend to, you know, sometimes be going for very low fat, trying to make sure they're, they're hitting their carbs and their proteins, like I said earlier, but then maybe missing out on some of their essential fats or a sugar, sometimes people will completely um, try to ignore or try to eliminate sugars completely. But actually in sport and in high intensity sport, sugars are can play a role in terms of one of our energy sources. Underfueling, um, again, is, is a common mistake. So it's sometimes it's that taking the healthier, the clean eating to extremes, which can lead to that low energy availability. So it, it's the, the combination of what I mentioned there about needing all of your food groups, needing a fat sources, needing needing a variety of nutri nu nutrients and making sure that you're having your energy rich foods when you need them. So when energy um, demands are high, we need to increase our energy intake. Another mistake is that all or nothing approach, and that can sometimes lead to that restricting and binging pattern. So in terms of, oh, I'm going to completely avoid, give up chocolate and then chocolate is the only thing you'll think of and then you'll binge on chocolate. So it's it's that um, everything in moderation. So there should be no food groups that are completely off limits. So everything um, in, in moderation is probably one of the, the key bits um, to make sure that th that doesn't feed into that sort of binge and pattern. 
a key pet hate of mine is younger athletes not learning how to cook. Remember, at some point in time, you will move out from home, so you will need to know how to how to cook. So, um, getting a I suppose a good um, number of sort of go to recipes under your belt that you can cook. And another one that comes up a good bit is that worrying about um, match day nutrition to nearly to the detriment of your training nutrition like it uh, you're training an awful lot more than you're playing matches so you and you're making all your adaptations via your training so if you're not if you're not focused on your your training nutrition your weekday nutrition which is that base it can come to match day and you can be completed de completely depleted so making sure that the, the same um focus is going on to your weekday nutrition intake as it is going into match day. Um, I just to touch on this because it probably has come up a good bit over um, the whole lockdown. So over the past year, it's been a difficult enough um, year and some people have found that they're just bored of meeting. So they, they might be overeating probably because they're at home an awful lot. So what one or two, um, one athlete that I was working with, he just, he found every time he went into the kitchen, he was opening the fridge. So he just stuck this sign on the door or uh, inside his fridge, telling him that he wasn't hungry, he was just bored. So do something that works for you. So try distraction techniques. So instead of going into the kitchen, go outside for a walk, phone a friend, have fruit available at easy access and at eye level. So we tend, when we open our fridge, sometimes the, the first thing we can see is the fizzy drink and that would be might be what you go to. Whereas if some of your fruit is fruit and yogurts are up on your, your eye level, then maybe they become the go to. And then um, the, the key one here again is planning your meals and snacks. So then to, to finish up, like as we're approaching I suppose finishing up here, I just want to touch on supporting behaviour change. The key bit with food and nutrition is an awful lot of it is down to you yourself at home. So when it comes to you in the gym or on the pitch, you're under the watchful eye of your coach. You have someone there telling you what to do, supervising your session and you, you do what you're told, you do your session and you go home. When it comes to food, it's all done, majority of it done away from away from training. So it's on your own. So we want to make sure that I suppose the capability, so the education around why nutrition is important, the opportunities, so the foods that we're talking about to support your nutrition and the motivation. And the motivation should hopefully come from the, I suppose, the key reasons of how nutrition can support a fit and healthy player. So making sure that the, the motivation or the, the reason why nutrition can support a fit and healthy player is known should should help um, in in, I suppose, encouraging better nutrition practices. Coaches and parents can reinforce some of the messages by, you know, something as simple as having your water bottle at training, making sure that no one is coming to train and starving. Um, making sure that when training is finished, people are going home and they are getting their post training recovery in. Access and support. So again, if you're if you're a coach or a player, a coach or a parent, and you notice that one of your players is just is struggling, you know, performance isn't where you would expect for the volume of training that they're doing. Access nutrition support um, if you if you think that player actually might need support. And avoiding that misinformation. So wherever you're hearing misinformation or um, social media, I suppose, trends, wherever possible to try and bust some of those myths. So then to, to summarise, in terms of how nutrition is key to help you be ready, we're looking at proper nutrition and timed properly and planned properly can help reduce your injury risk reduce your illness risk so it'll keep you on the pitch for longer and it will support training adaptations, improve your recovery. It can also provide like a sociable and a fun outlet. Like I said, fun food should be fun. So we should be enjoying our fun with our we should be enjoying our food with our teammates when restrictions ease that bit more. And finally Hopefully by creating awareness, there will be an individual focus area then that you might be able to take away from this evening session, um, which can help you in terms of your return to sport and be ready for your return to the pitch whenever that might be.
That is it. I think I've finished up just about on time, Cahal. Um, and I just have here some um, information details. So if anyone does want to contact me, um, I have my email address here. Uh, and I also have the email address of that Sport and Exercise Nutrition Group, um, which I had mentioned at the start, which is that um, list of registered practitioners in Ireland if anyone does want to access um, nutrition support. So that is it. Thanks for that. Thanks very much for your details. Uh, I love you used there to go early on the scale. Um, I know. Very oh, I'm sorry, no, you're just getting a little bit of feedback on your audio. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, I think I can hear. I think I can hear. Make out the question, Carl. Is that better now? I have it now. That's perfect. Yeah. No, I was just saying. Um, I just love some of the analogies you use there, particularly the one around the the scales. I know there was a few times during lockdown I was probably tipping it in the in the wrong way, and uh, the the three R's for recovery there: um, rehydrate, refuel, and rebuild. I suppose it's so simple, um, but so so important after after games and training sessions. There is um, there's a couple of questions in there. I might uh, I might just get you to answer them. Um, the first one. How do I know I'm eating enough? Yeah, and that, that's, you know, that's a hard question. That's that one. It's a fine balance at times. So what my key question there um, would be, are you changing your food dependent on your training session? So if you find that you're eating the exact same food every day, no matter what your training session is, that would be a trigger to say, well, OK, am I getting enough on the days that I'm training harder? Another um, question I would ask is, what's your energy levels like? So are you tired? Are you finding yourself that you're not, you're not, you don't, you're, you're waking up after a good night's sleep, but you're still tired. So it would be bits around like that in terms of energy levels and are you changing your food according to your training sessions would be a key kind of trigger to, to give a hint of whether you are eating enough or not. Perfect. So I suppose listen, listen to your body. Absolutely. And yeah. how you're going. And I suppose a follow on question then that has come in there, um, it's kind of linked. How many calories should I be eating or should I be counting my calories? Yeah, and you might notice there that I didn't mention calories at all, I don't think, throughout that session. And that's because, again, calorie intakes are so variable. So, again, we're, we're talking here to a large, um, a large audience. We have everyone of different shape sizes, different training intensities and um, different training volumes. So and you could also you could have someone who might eat 2000 calories, but they might be 2000 calories and yet not meet their protein or the carbohydrate requirements. So I would instead of working off a, a calorie total, I would work more off those sort of high training day, low training day, moderate training day and adjust your meals according to the type of day you have. You get a much better um, guide for food and as well, you know, I don't want people focusing in, looking at calorie content and comparing one pack of biscuits to another pack of biscuits and picking, you know, a lower pack of biscuits because they're five calories less and then actually not having their protein in their form of their food after a training session, which is going to compromise recovery. So it's much better in terms of total foods and the combinations of foods as opposed to total calories. Yeah, and you yeah, some good images there around um, the, the plates and how that changes throughout the training as well. Um, you would have covered this slightly throughout it, but uh, it's a question that has come in a few times. Um, what is the best food to eat before training? Yeah, so some of your, you know, before training, what you want to make sure is that the timing, I suppose, the timing of your 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 pre-training meal or snack. So if it's going to be a larger meal, um, you're talking about trying to have it maybe three hours before your training session to, to give your, your body a chance to get it absorbed and digested. Um, if it's a snack, so if it's a case that it's something smaller and it's going to be a snack and it is maybe 60 to 90 minutes beforehand, it'll be something lighter because you don't have as much time to digest it. So if it's a larger meal, again, it is that source of carbohydrate. So it could be 
It could be, so it, I'll take a typical example if it's a seven o'clock training session and I've had my lunch at two o'clock and I'm going to have a snack at five o'clock and train at seven o'clock. My five o'clock snack there could be um, a peanut butter sandwich with banana, which would be, you know, ideal in terms of giving me carbohydrates before training session. It could be that smoothie that I mentioned, which is your oats plus your milk yogurt, um, honey and fruit. Or if it's my dinner and it's a little bit earlier, it could be my pasta with my chicken or it could be my potato, meat and veg. So there's no there's no magic food. The key bit is that it contains carbohydrate. It's easily digestible. So you're not going having a huge big meal 60 minutes before you go training and then you'll get a stitch as soon as you start running. So you have to give your body time to let it digest. And you don't want anything that's too high in fat or high in fiber because that will slow down the digestion of the food and it could lead to that sort of the an irritable stomach, we'll call it on the pitch. So, um, so yeah, I have, there is a list of those snacks that are, are there that are suitable and it, it could be like your flapjacks, your banana bread, your um, banana sandwich, your bowl of cereal. They tend to be some of your sort of higher carb snacks, which are ideal pre-training. Perfect. And uh, we just we, we just asked two more there. Um, I know you mentioned in terms of everything in moderation, but um, are there any foods that that players should not be eaten? No, like I suppose that's the and that's the one thing that sometimes people ask me, they're like, oh, but you didn't talk about crisps or chocolate or fizzy drinks. So you might have noticed that on the on that the food permit, those those foods, all foods are in that permit. It's just that maybe our, our chocolate or our crisps or our fizzy drinks, they shouldn't be part of every meal. So all the foods I was talking about were foods that should be part of every meal. So our, our, our treat foods, like our, our, our nice foods, our sociable foods, our fun foods, they, sh they are all there in moderation. They just may not be every meal every day. Perfect. Um, thanks very much. And there's just there's a, there's a couple of questions around uh, supplements. We won't go into it in, in big, big detail, but um, should I be taking supplements to help gain lean mass? Again, that's a, a really common question that we get asked, and a lot of it is sort of your your younger um, your younger males who think that they it, it, that it's all about protein to gain to develop lean mass, and an awful lot of the time it's not. It's just increasing total energy, and it's having regular protein feeds. So we can get all of our protein. So those kind of figures that I had up there in terms of protein requirements of anywhere between about 1.2 to 1.8 gram per kg body weight, we can get all of that from our food. So we don't need, like a lot of the time people think supplements are these, you know, it's this quick fix or it's this um, magic pill that we can take. But a lot of the time we just need to plan our food, we need to increase our total energy intake and we need to have consistent meals spread throughout the day, especially pre and post our training. And that's where we develop our lean muscle mass along with our training programme. Perfect. And just one last one there in terms of uh, supplements. Um, it's just been asked here about advice for, for younger players who want to take the likes of creatine or caffeine or them, them type of supplements. Again, a lot of the time with under 18s, they're not they're not needed. They're not indicated. You'll get an awful lot of your your benefits from from your your planning, your prep, your timing of your food intake. It might be a, a different case if we're talking about a senior inter county player who has a, a much higher volume of of training, and that's part of their plan, and they've had a number of years of education support around around their nutrition. But for an underage athlete, I would make sure that all of all of what we've talked about today is covered and is ticked off before I would look to add in anything extra. Perfect. Thanks. So it's, it's concentrate on on whole foods there, and, yeah. and that right during that development phase. It's, it's like that, there. like the um the cupcake. It's that foundation. It's getting the foundation and the type and the timing of all of your daily nutrition right before you look anywhere else and that your whole foods will provide everything that we do need, especially for our underage athletes. Yeah, no, I like that analogy too, which uh, everyone loves icing on the top of the cake, but uh, it's generally the worst for you. So 
I suppose that's a good one to take out of that. Um, we'll finish on that, Laura. Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to prepare tonight, coming on, um, answering all the questions. Um, there's an awful lot in there for coaches and players, and it'll be a great resource for everyone on tonight and, and online for the future as well. So thanks very much and, and best of luck to yourself. Um, no Thank you. Next, next, we're going to have uh, Des Ryan, who is the lead of the Gaelic Athletic Development Workgroup and the head of sports medicine and athletic development at Arsenal FC. Thanks, Cahal. And, and thanks, Laura. That was very important information and very practical. So essential for all people getting ready to, to be ready to play. Um, so the update I have is tomorrow block four of the athletic development program is released. So that's three blocks done, six weeks done. And we call that the activity phase, laying the foundation, getting back, getting active and um, learning exercises. Now we're stepping it up and we're stepping into the development phase. So there's a bit more intensity in the exercise, a bit more challenge. Um, because pretty soon the underage players are back training on the 26th of August. Um, so we have to be ready for that. And this program is very important. We're, we're aiming to increase enjoyment. We're aiming to increase participation. We're aiming to increase performance. But one of our big aims is to reduce injury. And most injury, injuries occur from doing too much, too fast, after doing too little, for too long. So the work before you go back is really important. And we want to gradually introduce you to that work. So with the Be Ready to Play program, we'll have advice, advice for coaches. Because right now, coaches should be planning, should be planning your sessions for when you come back. And we'll be given some tips. We'll be given tips like avoid intense testing week one, uh, avoid intense sprints, early doors uh, and intense kicking, avoid that early doors and gradually build it up. So there'll be advice available that will be built into the athletic development program as we go along and we'll be providing some information on that. So tomorrow is block four, uh, the activity block and we're starting the development phase and that's really important for players getting back training the underage players on the 26th of August. And at some stage, adult players will be going back to play. So the more of this athletic development program you do, the more prepared you'll be. Coaches uh, will provide some advice and that will help with your planning and make a smooth transition back playing and help performance, help participation, help enjoyment and help reduce that risk of injury. And all that is supplemented with these sports science webinars. The nutrition is important. The physio content is important. We've got psychology coming up. We've got skill acquisition, performance analysis. And in May, um, we've got a very good speaker, I will say, uh, from, uh, introduced to us from the sponsors, UPMC, an NFL athletic trainer with the Pittsburgh Steelers, John Norwig. And I had the pleasure of chatting to him lately, and he's a, he's a very, very experienced man. So some great advice will be will be shared there. So block four released tomorrow. Um, over back to you, Colin. Thanks very much, Des. Yeah, you're good there, Carl. Okay, so next next up, um, we have the the next webinar which will be taking place uh, this day, two weeks on the 27th at 7 p.m. as well. We have Richard Bowles um, and Anne O'Dwyer from uh, Mary Immaculate College. This is our coaching webinar and the title will be Coach Reflection and Player-Centered uh, Coaching Implications for Player and Coach Development. So um, they're both coaches and uh, lecturing down in uh, Mary Immaculate College and they're reporting on, reporting on, on some studies they have carried out with, with various teams down there. So we, we look forward to that. So um, just I'd just like to thank you all for, for joining us this evening on our UPMC webinar and I hope you stay with us uh, to be ready to play. Bye bye.